He told himself that he had to attend the party, that his family had the right to demand it of him, that he had to learn to like their kind of pleasure for their sake, not his own. He wondered why this was a motive that had no power to impel him. Throughout his life, whenever he became convinced that a course of action was right, the desire to follow it had come automatically. What was happening to him, he wondered. The impossible conflict of feeling reluctance to do that which was right, wasn't it the basic formula of moral corruption? To recognize one's guilt, yet feel nothing but the coldest, most profound indifference, wasn't it a betrayal of that which had been the motor of his life course and of his pride? He gave himself no time to seek an answer. He finished dressing quickly, pitilessly. So a few things to notice about this passage and what's happening here. One, the first thing is he has the conscious conviction that he really ought to go to this party and that his family has the right to demand it of him not for his sake, but for the sake of their pleasure. That's his conscious moral viewpoint. Second thing to notice, though, is that what he's worried about here is that he doesn't want to do it anyway. He has no desire to follow what he believes to be his duty. And then the third thing is he does it anyway. He forces himself to go to the party against his inclinations. And that's, I think, part of why it's described as something he's doing pitiless, pitilessly. He has no pity for himself in this kind of case. This is the kind of situation, the one that Reardon's in, that I think the virtue of pride, that radiant selfishness of soul, is there to help us avoid. Stand back from the mic, okay. It, that's what it's there to help us avoid. Uh, who among us, if, if there are any among us who've never faced Reardon's problem of believing that something is right but not wanting to do it, we might face the, the converse problem. We might have, the, have things that we really want to do but which we don't think are actually good things to do. It's another version of the same kind of conflict and that's, th that's why pride is a virtue that's important for all of us to think about, not just those who are in Reardon's situation. Pride's very important in the objectivist ethics. Galt, at one point in his speech, calls it the sum of all virtues. And there's a lot about the virtue of pride that is distinctively objectivist. As we'll see today, it relies on all kinds of distinctively objectivist presuppositions. Uh, and it's it's also the case that objectivism is virtually unique among philosophies in holding pride to be a virtue. Think here, for instance, of Christianity, which regards pride as a major sin. So one thing that I want to emphasize to begin with is that when we're talking about the virtue of pride, we are not necessarily talking about the feeling of pride. I think that they're closely related, but it's important to get clear on what the difference is. Feelings, as, as we'll talk about, are automatized responses that we have uh, to the world in, in light of our value judgments. But because they're automatized, we don't directly control them. Morality is about what we directly control. Uh, moral virtues give us guidance for what kinds of choices we should make. That's what pride is there to do. And so, it can't just be that the feeling of pride, of feeling really good about something that you're doing, is, is all there is to the virtue of pride. Pride is telling us to do something, to make certain kinds of choices. And the big question is going to be, well, exactly what choices? It's clearer, I think, in other virtues what the choices that are recommended are. So, for example, the virtue of honesty, uh, the idea is you ought to not fake reality. What kinds of actions does the virtue of pride recommend? You can tell that there's some kind of difference between the mere feeling of pride and the virtue of pride when you get closer to the end of the book and uh, Dagny meets <coughs> Galt for the first time in the valley and one of the things that she says about him is the shape of his mouth was pride and more. It was as if he took pride in being proud. So you can see that there's, there's a 
there's, a, there's the being proud, but then there's the taking pride in the being proud. They're two different things. The virtue of pride is some kind of perspective that we can adopt on our feeling of pride, and as we'll see among uh, on other feelings as well. So I'll start off by just giving an initial kind of abstract characterization of what this virtue of pride is. And I'm taking this passage from uh, the Objectivist Ethics, which is the lead essay in The Virtue of Selfishness. This is very abstract, so much of what we're going to do today is going to be giving examples and illustrating what is meant by this. There she writes, the virtue of pride is the recognition of the fact that as man must produce the physical values he needs to sustain his life, so he must acquire the values of character that make his life worth sustaining. That as man is a being of self-made wealth, so he's a being of self-made soul. That part is taken from Galt's speech in Atlas Shrugged. The virtue of pride can, be, uh, can best be described by the term moral ambitiousness. It means that one must earn the right to hold oneself as one's own highest value by achieving one's own moral perfection. So a couple of things to notice about this passage is that you can, you can divide it roughly into two pieces. There's the part at the beginning talking about values of character. Now, pride is a virtue. A virtue is an action that you engage in in order to attain certain values, objects of action. So, it starts out by saying, this is what pride is helping you to get, certain kinds of values of character. We'll talk more about what that means. And then the question is, well, what do you do to get them? What's the action that's entailed by the virtue of pride? And that's, that's the moral ambitiousness part. What I'm going to do for the rest of the day today is to drill down into both of those two big ideas and to talk about what each of them means. What are the values pride aims at, what, and what actions does it demand? The way that I'm going to do that, this and drill down into each, uh, part of this here is taken from the paragraph in Galt's speech about pride. I'm actually going to use that bigger paragraph as our guidance. It is a bigger paragraph. I'm not going to read this all to you right now. Uh, but I'll, we're going to go through it bit by bit. And I'll just note, you can divide it roughly into the same two big pieces, starting out with what values of character pride is going after, and then the moral ambitiousness section, what it's actually asking you to do to get them. I'm going to actually divide it into about five little bits. And I'm going to read each of them as we go, comment on each, and try to relate the abstractions in this paragraph to some of the concretes in the story uh, of Reardon, especially in Atlas Shrugged, because I think this is a virtue that is especially important to him. <clears throat> so we'll start by talking about that first big half of the idea, the values that the virtue of pride is concerned with achieving. And for that, let's, let's take a look at the first bit of the longer paragraph from Galt's speech about pride. Galt says, pride is the recognition of the fact that you are your own highest value, and like all of man's values, it has to be earned. That of any achievements open to you, the one that makes all others possible is the creation of your own character. That your character, your actions, your desires, your emotions are the products of the premises held by your mind. That as man must produce the physical values he needs to sustain his life, so he must acquire the values of character that make his life worth sustaining. So uh, it's worthwhile comparing the virtue of pride here to the virtue of productiveness which is maybe a little easier to understand. Productiveness is the virtue of reshaping the earth and the image of your values in order to create the material values that you need to live. So that's a virtue that's concerned with creating certain kinds of values, which you then need for other purposes. And pride's the same way, except that it's not about creating material values that you need for your life. It's about creating certain kinds of spiritual values that you need for your life, values of character. And we need to say a little bit here about what, it, what we mean by a value of character, especially what do we mean by character? Because a person's character, especially his moral character, is not simply the sum of all of his actions. It's not simply all the things that one has done. Uh, your character is something that's enduring about you. It's something that's entrenched. It's, it's an ongoing state uh, that is characteristic of you. 
characterizes your kind of typical way of acting. It doesn't force you to act in a certain way, but it, it makes you want to act, perhaps, in a certain way. Uh, a good example here of what I'm talking about is what, what you might call your emotional dispositions. Uh, your tendency to feel certain ways about certain situations. So just a simple example here. Uh, some people are socially awkward. They don't like being in large crowds. I'm one of them. We do it anyway, uh, but it's our character to not really like these situations, and it's a hard thing to do. Other people are very gregarious. They love to have lots of people around, and it's, it's a lot easier for them to motivate themselves to do that. That's an issue, I think, of, of character. Uh, that's an emotional disposition. But you'll notice that what Galt says here about character, and especially about emotions, reflects the distinctively objectivist view that emotions are the products of our premises, of our cognitive premises, especially about what's valuable to us. Your character, your actions, your desires, your emotions are the products of the premises held by your mind. This is a view of emotions that, is, that comes up a lot in Atlas Shrugged, including with Reardon himself. So shortly after that scene that I read to you from before the anniversary party, uh, Reardon meets Francisco for the first time at the party. And there's a scene there where Francisco greets him at the window. Reardon's looking out the window at the storm that's outside on the plane. And, he, uh, and Francisco's able to deduce not only what Reardon's feeling in this moment because of the way he looks, but what he must be thinking that leads him to feel this way. You stood there and watched the storm with the greatest pride one can ever feel because you're able to have summer flowers and half-naked women in your house on a night like this in demonstration of your victory over that storm. Or another example of how his thinking is responsible for his feeling is the scene where he meets Dagny Tagger for the first time. If you remember, it's, he sees her on a flatbed car uh, on the railroad. And what's interesting about that scene is that he doesn't start by knowing who she is. He doesn't know that it's Dagny Tiger. He only knows that it's a girl on a flatbed car. And his initial emotional response is one of kind of uh, is detached aesthetic pleasure at seeing someone so youthful uh, and, and, uh, and confident in her bearing. But when someone tells him that that's Dagny Taggart, the vice president of the railroad, that feeling changes from aesthetic pleasure to sexual desire. And that's a change in his feelings that's happening because of something that he knows about her. Now one question that comes up here is, how does this view of emotions relate to the scene that we just talked about where he's contemplating going to this party, he, th he believes, he thinks that it's the right thing to do, but he doesn't want to do it. That looks like a case where his, his feelings aren't matching up with his thinking. Well, I think there you have to bring in a very important additional consideration about the nature of character. And that's that our character is made up of these emotions and of these premises, enduring premises which can be either explicitly consciously held or subconsciously held and implicit. And that's another enduring part of us. So, uh, for instance, at that scene with, at the window with Francisco, uh, after Francisco tells Reardon how he's feeling, Reardon says, now I guess what, uh, now I'll guess what you're thinking. Go ahead, say that it's evil, that I'm selfish, conceited, heartless, cruel. I am. So he feels proud about his accomplishments and his work, but he also thinks they're evil. There's a conflict there between his implicit view that's leading him to feel this pride and his explicit view that regards that kind of pride as evil. Likewise in the scene when he first has sex with Dagny, he obviously desires her for the reasons that we talked about before, but he also feels all kinds of pain and guilt. Uh, the way that Dagny describes it is she knew that every gesture of her desire for him struck him like a blow. There was some shudder of incredulous anger within him. So, and I think the same thing is going on in the scene where he's trying to motivate himself to go to the party. On some level, he thinks he ought to go, but if he doesn't have any desire for that, on some other level, he doesn't really think he ought to go to the party. He doesn't really think he has that selfless duty. He has a character that is in conflict with itself. His implicit and his explicit premises are in conflict. Uh, you can only hold contradictions if one of them, if one end of the contradiction is explicit but the other is implicit. 
And this kind of conflicted character, in Reardon's case, as you can see, leads to a kind of paralysis. It makes it hard for him to act. That is not having achieved all of the values that make his life worth sustaining. There's more work that he needs to do on his character to get uh, to remove the conflicts and to make his motivation unimpeded. You know, compare that, for instance, to someone like Dagny, who doesn't have anything like this kind of guilt, either about her work or about her sex life. And she is, she is much more uninhibited in her motivation throughout the story. We'll talk more about her in my talk yes, uh, tomorrow on purpose. But now here's the, here's the puzzle. Uh, I've just spent a bunch of time talking about how desires and emotional dispositions and things like this are really important to, to values of character, and that's a concern of the virtue of pride. But I also said earlier that you don't directly control your emotions. They're automatized responses. And morality is supposed to give you guidance about the things that you do have uh, some kind of control over. So what's going on here? Well, the next part of Galt's speech has an answer to that question. And this is a famous part. And all of these passages I'm reading uh, begin with that clauses connected back to pride is a recognition of the fact that as man is a being of self-made wealth, so he is a being of self-made soul. But what does it mean to make a soul? You, you certainly don't start uh, by snapping your fingers and suddenly you've, you've made yourself a soul. You don't have uh, direct control over your emotions, your dispositions, or even your premises, not directly. You can't just say, I'm going to stop being an altruist. But notice the way he sets it up here. As a man's a being of self-made wealth, so he's a being of self-made soul. Well, you don't just snap your fingers and, and create wealth either. You have to work at it. Wealth is a value that has to be achieved. Well, so, of course, are the values of character that we've been talking about. You don't have direct control over them, but you have indirect control over them. And this is an idea, this idea of self-made soul generally in objectivism is a viewpoint that reflects the distinctively objectivist theory of free will, which says that the actions that you undertake uh, that are motivated by the certain kinds of feelings that you have, which are the products of premises that you hold, are all ultimately up to you. They're all ultimately in your control because those premises depend on the extent to which you choose to think or not to think. The level to which you engage your mind, focus on reality, try to figure out what's true, is what determines whether you form these premises in the first place or whether you accept them from other people. And this is definitely something that we can see the case in Reardon. He's, he's a kind of prototypical example of somebody who's described as a self-made man. But he's not a self-made man just because he's chosen to engage, sorry, he's chosen to engage in a lot of work. Where did that work come from? It came in part from his work ethic. Where did he get his work ethic from? It's something that not everybody has. Uh, not everybody even in the same, growing up in the same kind of situation as Reardon has. Note the contrast between Reardon and his brother Philip. It's going to be itself a product of certain kinds of choices that he makes about how to think about his life that don't reduce to his genetics or his environment. And you can see that this is something, this kind, of, this kind of ethic that he has created for himself is something he has to continue to create for himself on an ongoing basis. Uh, a really good example here is in the, uh, a scene uh, around book, uh, book two, chapter one, right after the equalization of opportunity bill has been passed, after they've started to kill Colorado and the John Galt line is starting to close down and things are looking really uh, despondent for both Reardon and Dagny. Uh, Reardon is starting to lose his ethic, his, his, his feeling of confidence about the world. He's starting to gain sympathy for the idea that there's, uh, that there's some kind of impotence to human action. And he's even losing his desire for Dagny because of that. But he's able to pull himself out of that slump at one point by having a conversation with Dagny about the man who invented the motor. They don't know who he is yet, but they're talking about that man who invented the motor. He was really a real person, wasn't he? He was able to create this motor in, in such a situation. And it's by thinking about that kind of example that he's able to regain uh, his, 
his view of existence. What he knew, what he discovered tonight was that he reca his recaptured love of existence had not been given back to him by the return of his desire for her, but that that desire had returned after he regained his world, the love, the value and sense of his world. In objectivism's view, there's a lot that's up to you in this same way. There's a lot about your soul that you can, you can ultimately control, not by snapping a finger, but by engaging in different kinds of thought processes. You can, you, can, you can control and change your view, your basic view of the universe, your sense of life. You can control your style and method of thinking, your what we call psychoepistemology. Uh, if you want a really good summary of uh, this whole view, I, I strongly recommend Ankar Gatte's essay in the companion to Ayn Rand, A Being of Self-Made Soul, where he cashes all of this out. And one of the most important things for our purposes that he cashes out there is a third thing which is the crucial value of self-esteem. And that is a value that the virtue of pride has quite a lot uh, uh, to do with. So I wanna go now to the last major section of the first half of that paragraph where this is the topic. Galt says, pride is a recognition of the fact that to live requires a sense of self-value. But man who has no automatic values has no automatic sense of self-esteem and must earn it by shaping his soul in the image of his moral ideal, in the image of man, the rational being he's born able to create but must create by choice. Now, as you know, uh, self-esteem is often grouped with reason and purpose, two other cardinal moral values in objectivism. I'm going to be talking more about purpose tomorrow. But self-esteem is particular, and I think those are all values of character that pride concerns itself with developing. But self-esteem is a special focus here because it's a value of character that is directly concerned with the issue of making life worth sustaining, which was what Galt was talking about earlier on, that you want to have a character that gives you the kind of motivation that makes it worth going on. And that's what self-esteem directly concerns itself with. As you know, there's a distinctively objectivist view of self-esteem. Self-esteem is the conviction that you're able to live and worthy of living, uh, that uh, you have confidence in yourself and you, you have respect for yourself. And if you think about what that means, somebody who f believes they can do it, someone who thinks they can use their mind to get by in life, that will result in a certain motivational perspective. They'll be a confident person. As opposed to what? As opposed to the feeling of fear, of anxiety, Likewise with that other big part, the uh, conviction that you're worthy. Someone who has that conviction is going to feel the feeling of pride about their life. If they don't have it, what will they feel instead? They'll feel something like guilt. And here it's worth looking again at Reardon. Reardon on the whole seems to have a lot of self-confidence. He, he's, he's convinced of the efficacy of his own mind to solve problems in the world. But because he adopts certain kinds of moral premises, like the one that he mentioned uh, ha about having a duty to his family's pleasure, not to his own, he, 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 his conviction of his worth is undercut, and it leads to pervasive guilt that he faces uh, about all kinds of situations in his life. So just to give a few examples, at one point early in the novel when he's uh, first starting to work with Dagny, he says to her, we're a couple of blaggards, aren't we? We haven't any spiritual goals or qualities. What does that say about his conviction about his own worth? A little later, and this is actually right before the anniversary party, he thinks to himself, uh, he took it for granted that he had dedicated himself like the martyr of some dark religion to the service of a faith which was his passionate love, but which made him an outcast among men. So he loves his work, but he regards it as, as a kind of priesthood in a dark religion. Or think about his relationship with Dagny. I already mentioned the kind of pain that he feels when they, they have their first sexual encounter. But afterwards, the next chapter, the, what he says to her is, what I feel for you is contempt, but it's nothing compared to the contempt I feel for myself. Now that's not a conviction that you are worthy of happiness and worthy of living. And it has implications for his life. So for example, later on after the equalization of opportunity bill is passed, 
He knows that he's suffered an injustice. He knows that it's wrong. He knows that it's tearing away parts of his life. But he's not totally motivated to fight against it, in part because of the guilt that he's feeling on all of these other subjects. The way he puts it is, I, he would fight the looters, but the wrath and the fire were gone. He would fight, but only as one guilty wretch against the others. Again, that's not a conviction that he is worthy of, of life and happiness. And so even though you, you can say from a certain perspective that Reardon's got confidence, but he doesn't have this self-worth, not having the self-worth is going to eat away at his confidence. And you see that if he's not even motivated to defend himself against injustice, he's not going to be able to do the things that have been unjustly been taken away from him. He's going to lose the practice at doing those things. He's, he's going to lose confidence as well. But if you compare the situation that Reardon is in, to someone like Galt, we won't have too much time to talk about today. Well, what's the famous way that Dagny describes the look of Galt's face, apart from the one that I already quoted, proud of being proud? His is the face without pain or fear or guilt. And those are the exact emotions that one would have if one didn't have this basic conviction of self-esteem. So Reardon really needs to get more self-esteem. How is he going to get it? And how is the virtue of pride going to help him get it? That's where the second big chunk of material comes in, the part about what, how pride means moral ambitiousness. So next, here's the next section in that passage from Atlas. Pride is a recognition of the fact that the first precondition of self-esteem is that radiant selfishness of soul which desires the best in all things, in matter and spirit, a soul that seeks above all else to achieve its own moral perfection, valuing nothing higher than itself. Now, there's a lot of emphasis that's always put on the, the part here about seeking moral perfection. And the idea that moral perfection is even possible, darn it, my phone is not perfect. <laughs> the idea that moral perfection is even possible is something that is definitely distinctive to objectivism. But I think it's also worth pointing out that the virtue of pride is not just there to say, be moral all the time. It is saying that. And part of why pride is the sum of all virtues, is because it presupposes that you're also practicing all the other virtues, including integrity, which is telling you to be moral all the time. Dr. Smith is going to talk more about that virtue, I think, later today. But pride's doing more than that. It's doing more than just telling you to be moral all the time. It's, it's asking you to think about, well, if you're not being moral all the time, why not? What's wrong with your motivational set that's making it easier for you to do the wrong thing. So just take an example here. Suppose we have an unproductive person, someone very different from Reardon, who doesn't have that work ethic that we were talking about. Why don't they want to work harder? I mean, they can force themselves to do it, but if you just force yourself to do something you want to do all day, that's not self-sustaining. You'll burn out. So somebody who's practicing the virtue of pride in a situation like that, will think, why don't I want to do this job? Is it maybe that I don't know what this job is really all about, what it's for, what the purpose of it is? Do I maybe not agree with it? You know, did I take this job at a white shoe law firm just to pay off my law school debt, not because I actually like practicing the subject? Or is it maybe that I'm afraid to try new things? I could do something that I'm better at, that I like more, but I don't know if I'll succeed. Is there insecurity? some basic lack of self-esteem about your ability to succeed in life that's explaining why it is you're not motivated to do this job. Or take another example. Suppose there are things uh, that you want to do that you shouldn't want to do, and you know it. There are people who, are, who engage in sexual promiscuity, uh, many of whom probably don't want to be doing that. They know the bad things that it does to themselves. Well, if they begin to exercise the virtue of pride they'll start to think about, why do I want to do this all the time? Why am I always you know, chasing men or women uh, like a Don Juan? 
is it really because there's some real value that I'm trying to achieve there? Or is it maybe because there's some insecurity I have, there's some pain I'm suffering, I'm using this just pure physical pleasure as a kind of balm to cover up the pain? These are the kinds of questions that somebody who's practicing the virtue of pride is going to try to ask. And I think that's actually what Reardon's doing. I think he's doing it very early in the book. Even in that scene that I read to you at the beginning where he's concerned that he's betraying his own pride. Now it's true, he doesn't feel pride about what he's doing. And that's part of the problem. But he's noticing that problem. He's noticing, why don't I want to go to this party with, you know, for the woman who I allegedly love? What's wrong with me? Now he doesn't, he doesn't answer that question right away. He doesn't know how to answer that question right away. But he's, he's thinking about it. And th that chapter in particular is instrumental because it's where he meets Francisco for the first time. Francisco, who has some understanding about the connection between his feelings and his thoughts, and who's prompting him to think about the moral premises behind his thoughts. And uh, he's the one who points out when Reardon says that, it's, that he's evil and cruel. Uh, Francisco says, the only mistake with what you said is that you regard it as evil. And then throughout the rest of the story, of course, not just with Francisco, but with Dagny too, Reardon probes the premises behind his lack of self-esteem. In particular, why is it that he feels guilt? Why does he not regard himself as worthy of living? Francisco is the one who introduces to Reardon the very idea that there are different ways of thinking about morality. There are different moral codes. There's a morality of life. There's a morality of death. And which one do you practice? Which one do the others practice? And what's interesting is that the way that Francisco approaches this even appeals to the very pride that Reardon's already practicing. And here's, here's the prominent uh, passage where you see this happening. This is book two, chapter three. Francisco says to Reardon, you take pride in setting no limit to your endurance, Mr. Reardon, because you think you are doing right. What if you aren't? What if you're placing your virtue in the service of evil and letting it become a tool for the destruction of everything you love, respect, and admire? Why don't you uphold your own code of values among men as you do among iron smelters, you who won't allow 1% of impurity into an alloy of metal? What have you allowed into your moral code? So he's appealing to Reardon's existing pride to begin to uproot these these deficient premises of his that are causing this guilt, making it hard for him to motivate his action. Pride is a deeply psychological, deeply philosophical virtue. It bids you to engage in intensive introspection about why you do the things you do, why you want to do the things you do, why you think about the things that you want to do the way that you do. It's the kind of virtue that's, you know, in many cases, if you're practicing it properly and if you discover these problems with your self-esteem, for example, it will recommend, you know, maybe you should see a therapist. Maybe you need some help, like the kind you could, we, we, those of us, we all wish we could get from someone like Francisco in unearthing these premises and trying to challenge them. And at the end of the day, it, it bids you to do philosophy. It, it bids you to think about moral philosophy and to understand you know, why it is that your life is worth living and why you're able to achieve happiness in this universe. It's, it's a virtue that's then deeply focused on the self, on creating the best self that you can possibly have. It's the one that says you need to be able to act successfully and you need to enjoy doing it as you do it. So it's no wonder that pride is regarded as the ultimate sin by Christianity and by our culture at large, a culture which is anti-self, which says we have no right to exist for our own sake. And to think that we could perfect ourselves is a kind of blasphemy that, you know, to think of ourselves as, as like unto gods who could, who could make our own souls for ourselves. That's, so it's no wonder that they object to this radiant selfishness of soul. I'll wrap up by looking at the very last passage of that big paragraph from Atlas. Pride is the recognition of the fact that the proof of an achieved self-esteem 
Is your soul's shudder of contempt and rebellion against the role of a sacrificial animal, against the vile impertinence of any creed that proposes to immolate the irreplaceable value which is your consciousness in the incomparable glory which is your existence to the blind evasions and the stagnant decay of others. So I've spent some time today telling a little about the story of Reardon as he exercises the virtue of pride in order to gain the character value of self-esteem over the course of the novel and the various conflicts and struggles that he engages in in order to do that. Obviously, there's much more to the story that I can't go into today, but since I took you through all those struggles, I should at least end by showing you how, what, what it's like for Reardon when he overcomes these obstacles at the end of the story. And I'll read to you a section uh, from right after Reardon basically decides to go on strike. Uh, it's, it, he's returned to his mills. Uh, the, the raiders have just attacked the mills. Francisco has shown up. Uh, he's saved uh, Francisco's life. Maybe it was the other way around. And here's, here's the way he feels now that he's finally made the decision to go on strike. He felt a peculiar cleanliness. It was made of pride and of love for this earth. This earth which was his, not theirs. It was the feeling which had moved him through his life, the feeling which some among men know in their youth then betray, but which he had never betrayed and had carried within him as a battered, attacked, unidentified, but living motor. The feeling which he could now experience in its full, uncontested purity, the sense of his own superlative value and the superlative value of his life. It was the final certainty that his life was his, to be lived with no bondage to evil, and that bondage had never been necessary. It was the radiant serenity of knowing that he was free of fear, of pain, of guilt. Thank you. So we've got time, I think about 20 minutes for questions and something new, I don't know if you've heard about this yet, but since the whole conference is online, I mean, people have been watching us live just now, we're also gonna be taking questions from the online viewers and we have someone in the back who's going to uh, intersperse online questions with the ones that you ask live. If you want to ask a live question, the mic is right up here. We can do an online question, Ben. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> okay. From Luis. Uh, how does Ayn Rand's conception of pride differ from Aristotle's view? And have there been any other notable philosophers in the history of philosophy who have also venerated pride as a virtue? Okay, so I'll start by saying I'm no Aristotle expert. Um, there's some similarities and differences, though, given what I remember and know uh, about Aristotle's view of pride. One is that Aristotle's view of virtue is not nearly, in his view of virtue generally, is not as concerned with guiding choices as, as Ayn Rand's is. For him, virtue is itself a character state. It's an excellence of your character. Uh, he, doesn't, he says virtue is concerned with choice, but there's not the kind of focus on the kinds of choices that you make to achieve values in the way um, that Rand thinks. Now, there's still some, some big similarities. Uh, Aristotle regards pride as the crown of the virtues in, in just the same way as Galt talks about the sum of virtue. And there's probably a reason for that similarity because for Aristotle, pride is also a certain perspective that you take on your achievements. It's, it's on, uh, the idea is that you honor yourself for things that are actually good as opposed to having false pride where you think you're really great but you're not or as opposed to being humble, where uh, you maybe are good, but you're unwilling to recognize it. So there's definitely a, a similarity in subject matter. Of course, pride is the English translation of Aristotle's word me megalopsychia, and megalopsychia. And uh, so it's, it's unclear if it's you know, the exact same concept. But, um, and then the other question was about the other philosophers' views of pride, whether any other philosophers have similar views. Yes. Not, not too many. Um, obviously, since so many moral philosophers are influenced by the Judeo-Christian altruist worldview, uh, the one person who comes to mind as an exception to that trend is Nietzsche. 
and there's a lot of big differences between Rand's view and Nietzsche's views. But it's, of course, um, a line from Nietzsche that she quotes in the introductory chapter to The Fountainhead uh, from Beyond Good and Evil, Book 9, uh, The Noble Soul Has Reverence for Itself. And so, you know, Nietzsche's view of virtue is not systematically worked out. It's not clear what he's talking about when he's talking about virtue, and it's not clear if that's the same thing as pride, but there's some, there's some overlap there. And, of course, Rand read Nietzsche when she was young. Though it took a lot of difference, a lot of, it differed from him on fundamental philosophy later. So up here. So William James, I'm curious about how you can help differentiate between false pride and the virtue of pride. Uh, specifically, what sometimes uh, pride can be used uh, once you have achieved your moral ambition as a way to prevent like feedback and more critical analysis and that introspection you mentioned. How can you ensure that pride is being used as a way to set that moral ambition higher so that you're continuously doing, performing that introspection and pride is becoming a virtue instead of a way as avoiding feedback from looking at the world? Well, there's a lot there, and I'm not sure if I got all of it, but I, I will say something about how do you, how do you, uh, how do you combat false pride? Now, false pride is... is a way of thinking about the feeling of pride. Somebody who has false pride is somebody who feels really good about doing bad things or feels really good even though they haven't done a lot of good things. And so uh, what is it that leads someone to do that? It's a kind of defense value. One of the things that uh, is, is emphasized in the, especially the latter half of Galt's speech, part of the reason why there's so much discussion of self-esteem in Galt's speech is not so much to say what's good about having self-esteem, but to point out everybody needs self-esteem to motivate their action. And that's true even of people who, don't, who are not virtuous, that evil people need to still feel good about what they're doing to be able to motivate themselves. And that's, that's where uh, pseudo self-esteem comes from. There are uh, dozens of different philosophic viewpoints that in effect are rationalizations for vice. This is Ayn Rand's view that, that evil philosophies are systems of rationalization. And so false pride would be one example of that. Someone tells himself a story. Oh, yeah, I'm awesome because I am a Don Juan and I'm able to get all these, uh, all these uh, romantic partners, for instance. Some, and there are people who have false pride about that kind of thing. And it's an excuse they're telling themselves to, to feel good about themselves. They need to feel good. Otherwise, they won't be able to continue motivating their action. How do you guard against that? I can't say too much more apart from what I've said today, which is to talk about how uh, if, you're, if you begin to exercise the virtue of pride, someone who's like that hasn't been doing it, but if they begin to do it, um, they'll have to ask themselves, you know, why am I telling myself this? Am I telling myself a story just to feel good about myself? Is, am I really convinced of this? Why is it that I'm so defensive and so uh, I automatically try to defend myself against these charges by bragging? It, do, am I perhaps protesting too much? I'm not really convinced of this, and so it's just a defense value. Am I really doing good things here? That's where the introspection and the, the psychology and the philosophy come in. For details on that, I would, I would you know, need to be more of a psychologist. Thank you. Are we going to the live question or? Oh, oh, go ahead, okay. go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask about the process of, uh, process of character building. So you talked about how Reardon would be doing what he thinks is the right thing and not sure why he doesn't want to be doing it. And this can sometimes happen when reshaping your character and changing one's values. So I was wondering if you could speak to what one should be thinking about and paying attention to when kind of going through that process. Again, this is more of a psychological question, I think. Um, but you know, it's, it's worth thinking about that same example. So I mean, what is he paying attention to? He's, he's paying attention to a conflict. He's paying attention. He, there's something about his own soul he doesn't understand. I mean, on one level, I, I said pride's a deeply psychological, deeply philosophical virtue. So it, at the end of the day, what all the virtues demand of you is rationality. They're all expressions of the virtue of rationality. So pride is 
being rational, being reality-oriented, being fact-oriented with regard to your own psychological character. And so you need to try to understand it. You need to, you need to introspect. Don't just take things for granted. Don't take it for granted that every reaction that you experience is a good one, that it's something that has to be the way that it is, that it, that it can never change. Ask lots of questions about why you feel the way that you feel. You won't always be able to answer them, but if you're always on the premise of asking them, uh, that's going to help. And I, beyond that, I would have to be a therapist, I think. Thanks. Do we want to do an online question? Sure. Uh, OK. <clears throat> this is from Stephanie. You said that Reardon thinks his pride is evil, but does he? My take on the passage you read is he he acknowledges that that is how others would characterize it. Compare his view of sex, I think he does hold it as shameful. Thoughts? Well, the passage is certainly about what others think, but it's, it's more than that. It's, he's saying, I'll guess what you're thinking, go ahead, say that it's evil, that I'm selfish, conceited, heartless, cruel, I am. Now you could just you could say well he's 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 being uh, flippant he's saying if this be evil then make the most of it and there's there's I think some element of that but somebody who's got deep perfect self esteem wouldn't joke around about like something like that uh, it it is a bit defensive to do something like this and so I, I think that on some level he thinks. That it's, that it's wrong to have this pride about his life. It's the, it's the same reason why he's reluctant, uh, it's the same reason why he, he's, he's consciously convinced that he needs to go to the party, because he needs to do it for their pleasure and not his. That's a way of saying, what does my pride matter? What does, what does my happiness matter in this kind of case? So yeah, there's an element of rejecting others' views, but I think there's an element of uh, his own perspective here. Next at the mic. Yeah, I'm interested in the idea that, that Ayn Rand um, proposes um, that emotions are a sum of values and, and a sum of, of one's premises. And this, this perspective that, that emotions sort of reflect philosophical correctness in a sense and the correctness of premises is something that I is personally consistent with my experience uh, like when I am experiencing a negative emotion, I find that it is tied to I am resisting some form of reality that I'm attempting to avoid, or I am not living my life consistent with a certain value that I. So I so I find this consistent with myself, and I also see in other people um, who I s who who have trouble with uh, certain negative emotions. I see that they also possess philosophical premises, which I think are flawed and could perhaps be causing that. But I wonder though. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if it's, po is it possible that um, there can be cases where the emotional wiring of a mind can be flawed? Because I, I've had this sort of discussion with people, you know, that, that like philosophy, you know, bad philosophy leads to negative emotions and an unha unhappiness. Um, Okay. You might have turned the mic off. I don't know if someone did it for you. But um, so, yeah, there's a question of, basically the question is, do, is it the case that all emotions come from premises? And if what we're talking about is really an emotion, then I think the objectivist view is, is that it is. But there are things that you can confuse with emotions uh, where the causes are different. So I think there is such a thing as as temperament, uh, that you know, certain people are, you know, and you, you see this in young children. Young children start out with what look to parents, at least, like different temperaments, like mm. a happier baby, or he's a kind of quiet baby. And, and so there's a kind of baseline to that, that it, it may be that there's a hardwired baseline to sort of your level of motivational energy. And that can have impacts on how your emotions are experienced. But that's not the same thing as, as an emotion itself. An emotion is, is a much more 
uh, uh, conscious and direct reaction to a situation. And differences in temperament can influence the degree to which you feel that emotion or the, the form in which you feel that emotion, I think. And, and it may be that there's psychological evidence that some of that differences in temper, those differences in temperament could be hardwired. But I don't, I don't think that's the same as the kind of emotions we're talking about as being caused by cognition. The mic still isn't working here. It may well exist. Uh, I won't say too much more because I do think that's a psychological question, scientific question. Um, Leonard Peikoff gave a very interesting Fort Hall Forum one year called Modernism and Madness, which you can listen to on the Ayn Rand campus website, which talks about some of these issues. I'll just leave it at that and recommend that lecture. See if it's working. Not yet, no. We still have a bad mic up front. But go ahead. Project. Can you comment on He's giving you a new mic. Oh. Can you comment on the pride that Reardon had during his youth as compared to the struggles during his adulthood? For example, he uh, refused to steal an apple even when he was hungry. And was Lillian Reardon perhaps the catalyst in starting his downward slide? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't give the example of the refusing to steal the apple as like a central example of what it means to have pride. It's related, for sure, um, because you, you don't want to do something that's bad. And he's able to motivate himself to, do, to not do something that's bad. But yeah, it's true. Uh, there are many places in the book where Reardon thinks of the kind of pure self-esteem that he had when he was younger. And you saw a reference to that in that last passage that I read. And so, yeah, there is some indication that something's changed over the course of his life, that he started out with this kind of radiant selfishness of soul when he's young as a, as a, as a theme in Ayn Rand's work, that that's true of a lot of people. Um, I wrote an essay about this in, the, in Robert Mayhew's uh, essays on Ayn Rand's Fountainhead. And so something's changed for him. He's, he's, a, he's changed his thinking. He's accepted some kind of new premises uh, from the culture around him, no doubt. Lillian may have had something to do with that. I, I wouldn't blame it all on her. Uh, remember, Reardon has a mother uh, who is in on it with Lillian. And, um, and there's all kinds of I mean, cultural influences there. And that Reardon's not a philosopher. He's not like Galt or Ragnar. So he doesn't think about the same kinds of issues on a regular basis as all of them do. That makes him you know, more susceptible to accepting false premises about morality. It's, and that's uh, you know, part of why there's a need for philosophy, even for Reardon, not just for Ragnar. This is a distinction that Ayn Rand made between philosophy for Reardon and philosophy for Ragnar. He needs it to combat these premises. He's, he's a little bit more likely to absorb because, because of the culture he lives in and because it's not his profession. Another online question? Yes. Um. If the virtue of pride and the virtue of integrity basically highlight the same point about being loyal to rational principles, but pride adds the fact of self-esteem, why do we need to talk about integrity? Isn't this an unnecessary differentiation? Well, it's really important in objectivism that all of the virtues are, they form a unity. And so in order to practice integrity, you've got to practice pride and vice versa, same with all the other virtues. And that's for the reason that I mentioned before, that all these virtues are ultimately expressions of rationality. And so the question amounts to why conceptualize different virtues? In, one, in, in an important way, they're all talking about the exact same thing. They're all talking about the requirements of living a rational life. What they're doing is they're conceptualizing the same basic fact, the fact of human life, but they're doing it from different perspectives. Uh, Pride is doing it from the perspective of uh, how you need self-esteem. Integrity is doing it from the perspective of why you need to act on principle and why you need to act on the things that you think. Um, you could do the same thing with all the other virtues. You could show how each of them implies the others, but they all ultimately reduce to the same kinds of thing. And so why do we need different perspectives on the f same fact? Well, it has to do with our cognitive needs. Some of these 
aspects of the fact will be more salient to us in certain situations than in others. When we're making certain decisions, the, the, in certain cases, you know, the value of self-esteem is what's at stake. In other cases, it's acting on principle that's what's at stake. So, at the mic. Um, so, in your talk, you talked about how Reardon's lack of self-esteem was leading to an erosion of his confidence. And it, in my mind, I, I read that as it's inevitable in some sense, but, and then it made me start thinking because well, in September two th 2008, I was at Lehman Brothers, and the CEO of the firm was called the gorilla because how aggressively confident he was. And in town halls, I mean, you could see him exude that kind of nothing can stop me kind of confidence. And this is when he was actually running the firm. I mean, partly he was largely responsible for, the, for what happened there. So I, do, I was wondering if is that, is that causal connection necessarily necessary? The, the causal connection between what and between what? Between lack of self-esteem leading. Well, I, I mean, I'm making a premise, the assumption here that these guys who are generally called you know, the masters of the universe because they act like that, like, the, are they necessarily they have confidence, but they probably don't have the self-esteem, not in the way that Ayn Rand talks about it. And would the lack of self-esteem necessarily lead to a lack of confidence in how you act in the world? That's a hard question to answer for me, uh, in part because I'm not familiar with the examples that you're talking about. But one thing I would say about it is just that it's a, I think it's a mistake to assume that somebody has real self-esteem simply because of kind of their bearing in the way they talk and the aggressiveness of their confrontational style. Uh, that doesn't mean they have self-esteem. Sometimes it means they don't. Sometimes it means they, as I've, as I've mentioned before, uh, they have some insecurity and they need to compensate by making it look like they know what they're doing. Uh, even when they don't, or even when they don't think that what they're doing is right. It's, a, it's a kind of, again, a kind of defensive reaction. So you have to know a lot about a person uh, to decide whether what they've really got is that deep self-esteem. You've got to know um, something about their character over a lot of time uh, and about their, their views about morality. Yeah, so just to, to clarify, so from what, what you're saying, it's possible to fake confidence when, oh, you yeah. don't actually, when you actually don't have it or you don't have self-esteem, but confidence can be faked. Yes. I think we have uh, probably time for just one more question because it's 39 after and looks like it's going to be Harry. Uh, I want to speak in defense of Reardon because I think some of the questions uh, indicate that they're taking what you said in the wrong way. Um, I don't think Reardon lacked self-esteem. I think that Reardon, the way that Ayn Rand and the people around her described him was that he was a he had a subjective view, so he thought he was right about himself, but that he couldn't ask that others reach the same conclusion and he had to honor their codes. And that's like when he wants to go to the party, and I'd like to see if you agree with this, and when he wanted to go to the party, he had accepted their system and therefore he had to live up to it, but he didn't think that that was right for him. He thought it was right for them, and he had agreed to it. Yeah, so I certainly wouldn't say that Reardon lacks self-esteem in the way that Taggart lacks self-esteem. The way that I would put it is that he lacks perfect self-esteem. And, and self-esteem is a value that's a real achievement. I have a hard time reconciling the view that he has perfect self-esteem with, with the statements about how he has contempt for himself after, after sex with Dagny or with the idea that he's a, a servant in a dark religion. And so, uh, yeah, he's got a, a lot more self-esteem than someone like uh, Taggart, than someone like Eddie Willers, even. Um, but it's, I think self-esteem is something that comes in degrees, and, and he could use more of it. And the fact that he has that kind of psychological subjectivism that you mentioned, which you know, leads to the implicit acceptance of all these bad moral premises, is going to eat away at the self-esteem that he has. And I think you see it start to be eaten away, but then he starts to bring it back. So would you say he had basic self-esteem, but some mistakes or you, problems? I think that's fair, yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks, everybody, for coming. See you all soon at the general session. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe. 
and ring the bell to never miss a video.